for those who have just joined, welcome everyone um, to this webinar on place-based philanthropy for citywide change. My name is Miriam Birubé and I'm consulting director at the Tamarack Institute for Quebec and French speaking communities. This webinar is the third of a monthly series on place-based initiatives featuring a diversity of experiences made in Quebec. We had the first one on the roundtable model in Montreal, the second one on participatory evaluation. You can watch the recording if you're interested in learning more about Quebec. And today we're going to talk about place-based philanthropy. Uh, the funding landscape in Quebec and in Montreal uh, in particular has seen increased willingness for collaborative philanthropy and a renewed interest in place-based work, especially with the pandemic. So today uh, we're lucky enough to have three funders that will share with us their insights and their learnings um, from place-based work. But before I introduce them, um, I'd like to start uh, this uh, webinar with a word of gratitude and a land acknowledgement. So we begin this webinar by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous land. And as settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet and we thank all the generations of Indigenous people who have taken care of this land. Um, I myself am grateful to work, live and play in the traditional territory of the Ganyan Kehaga people. Jojage or Montreal, uh, colonially known as Montreal, has traditionally been a place of gathering for many First Nations and I'm grateful for that. As settlers, this recognition of the contributions and history. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, I had the great privilege of working with these three wonderful ladies uh, for the last few years on the Collective Impact Project uh, prior to joining Tamrac. I admire very much their work and their commitment, and I'm glad that today they will share their insights with us on place-based philanthropy. So Ratem Ayalan is the lead on the Collective Impact Project at Centraide of Greater Montreal. Patricia Rossi is Vice, Pre Vice President uh, Partnerships at the Lucie and André Chagnon Foundation. And Tasha Lachman is Vice President uh, of Community and Philanthropy at the Foundation of Greater Montreal. So welcome and thank you so much for being, us, um, being with us today. Now to start um, this conversation, to frame this conversation, um, I'd like to um, invite you to share what is important to you about place-based philanthropy. So just in a few words, what's important to you about um, place-based philanthropy? Rotem, would you like to start? Sure, thanks for having us, Miriam. Um, I guess the most important thing about place-based philanthropy is the, um, it's important to recognize that each neighborhood, we're, work, we're working on a neighborhood scale in Montreal, um, that each neighborhood is, is an ecosystem and each neighborhood is special and it requires site-specific responses um, and specific different types of support based on um, the neighborhood's specific ecosystem. Um, also that it, this this in engagement requires um, an active engagement by, the fu by funding partners and other collaborators. And it's really important to work with the local expertise that's different in each neighborhood. So in order, and I think also the most, uh, one of the most important things is that in order to have sustainable lasting change, um, it really needs to come from within the communities, within the neighborhoods that we support. And it has to reflect the goals of the community and really have community ownership to be long lasting. Wonderful, thank you, Ratham. Tasha, would you like to go? Hi everyone, so nice to be here with you. I'm hailing from Montreal, traditional um, Mohawk territory. And I'm not, I, I'm just gonna say again that um, Rotem, Patricia, Miriam, and I have worked really closely together for over three years. 
And so when I'm listening to Hotem talk about why place-based philanthropy is important to her, well, of course I echo what she says and it's always good to be reminded that we're so aligned with our partners when we're working on projects that are complex like, like the, the collective impact project that we'll talk to you about today. Um, <clears throat> I think that, that one of the things that, that Ratem didn't say, but that I know she also agrees with is, is this idea that when we're working in place-based philanthropy at a small scale, um, it's really a place where, where I believe, where we believe that systems change can happen. And that when we're working um, with such complexity, we have to be there as funders for the long haul and um, allow people to experiment and, and give people permission to fail. Because when we're trying to make change, um, we can't just be content with the status quo and the way things have always been done. And we're really with this place-based approach kind of turning traditional philanthropy on its head. Um, so as funders, we're experimenting and we also have to be um, giving that permission to experiment and to innovate to, um, to our partners who are working on the ground. And that does include permission to fail. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that because, because we, we all have little bits that we wanna add here. Thank you, Tasha. Patricia? Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Thank you for organizing this webinar. I'm happy to be with all of you. Well, why is place-based philanthropy important to us? Uh, I guess we can start by saying that for us, it's the best way to achieve transformational change. Important work we cannot do alone. And we acknowledge, like the uh, it's, it was already said by Ratem and Tasha, we acknowledge the expertise that already exists. We do not put ourselves in the position of being an expert, but believe in the work that the people are doing and the people that are also struggling with the issues are the experts and they decide what the priorities are, what the solutions are, but we're happy to support that work. Um, you know, we want to empower. What do we mean when we, when we say that? Well, we want to reinforce the capacities that exist already or that they decide that they want to develop. And uh, that's what we're there for. And all of this is uh, built on a trust-based relationship, which is based on listening, respect, confidence, and understanding that all of this work takes time. That's all I'd want to say for now. Thank you so much for the three of you to start us, uh, to start this conversation in such a good way. Um, now, my first question uh, is for you, Rotem, as the lead on the Collective Impact Project. Um, I'd like you to share with us this concrete example of place-based philanthropy, and also what are some of the benefits and, and challenges of this approach from a community's perspective? Sure, thank you. Um, I'll take the time to explain what the Collective Impact Project is. It's um, a uh, project that we're very proud of. We can move to the next slide. Um, that is, is a place-based philanthropy, but is also much more. Um, this is an image about our second phase of the Collective Impact Project that we're beginning, we're, we're starting, um, the beginning of next year. After uh, almost six years now of a pilot project of, of testing collaborative work um, on, on various scales, we are now beginning to work collectively through a second phase. And the common goal of the Collective Impact Project is to reduce poverty and social exclusion. And I'm gonna get, explain briefly um, all the different aspects of the project. Um, so the second phase is going to support all neighborhoods in Montreal if they would like to participate. And so far the, the echoes are very positive. All of the neighborhoods in Montreal would like to um, join the project and work collectively uh, around reducing poverty and social exclusion and using the approach that has been, a, uh, the, the collective impact approach that has been adapted to the Montreal context. And, Every neighborhood, um, other than working around poverty and social exclusion, every neighborhood is allowed to define collectively how they want to work on uh, how they want to work on reducing poverty in their neighborhood. And so, um, 
the initiatives that neighborhoods in the first phase decided to work on were um, very varying around, uh, some worked around their food system, some were, chose to work around housing issues uh, or around educational success. Also, there were initiatives working on reaching um, isolated people and building community infrastructure. Um, as long as the neighborhoods work collectively and around the collective impact uh, approach, um, the funders and the, the partners of this project are behind them and are there to support them and, um, and work collectively. And this second phase, we are putting forward more uh, more intentionally work around systemic change and how we can all work together to, to bring um, uh, the issues that are important to the neighborhoods around reducing poverty to, a, to another scale. And I think um, at the top of the image, uh, something I wanted to share because you asked us, Miriam, to talk about some lessons that we've learned. Um, through the first phase, we learned that neighborhoods generate social change on a larger scale when their collective strategies are supported in a flexible and adaptive way. And that's something that we are uh, working on uh, as funders, as, as collaborators, as, as partners, um, so providing support, but being flexible and being adaptive and knowing that communities, uh, that it takes time, that collaboration and, and work around poverty is a long-term goal and we have to work uh, with small steps and, and, and working towards, towards long change in, in little, little steps along the way. We've also learned that there are many conditions, winning conditions you know, that, that need to be put in place to increase neighborhood resilience. And these are around the, same, the five conditions of collective impact, um, working around a strong leadership, shared aspirations, citizens need to be involved in the issues that it affects them. And that's, I think, at the heart also of, uh, of the Collective Impact Project, that the initiatives that the neighborhoods choose to work on, first and foremost, are to improve conditions for citizens and involve citizens in decision-making and in implementation. Um, and uh, in addition, working with strate strategically with various alliances with partners to act on the existing systems and bring in, to, in change. And so um, to explain a little bit how the project works, um, the project is based around the neighborhood roundtables. And on the, my next slide, you can advance, Connor. Um, the next slide shows that how the backbones of, of the Collective Impact Project are the neighborhood roundtables. They're really at the heart of each neighborhood. And these roundtables, Miriam, I think you had a webinar earlier explaining what these neighborhood roundtables are, so I won't go into too many details, but they bring around all the important actors in a neighborhood, different stakeholders from the economic sector, um, the municipal sector, community sector, education, um, police, for example, and even citizens around the same table to collectively decide how they want to work uh, how, the, how they want to work around fighting poverty. And um, the larger uh, aspect, uh, the support structure around the Collective Impact Project in Montreal is based on uh, foundations, nine foundations in our first phase uh, um, and eight in our second phase, in addition to three strategic partners and institutions. So um, the Neighborhood Roundtable Coalition, the Public Health Department, and the City of Montreal are, are actors uh, in this project. And the operator is Centraide uh, of Greater Montreal or the United Way, that is where I work. Um, and the investment that the, that the foundations have put together collectively uh, is, is in place to support neighborhoods to, to work on a large, long scale, five years, uh, um, around their realizing their dreams for their neighborhood. And if we go to the next slide, I think um, I'm going to address one of the main benefits, Miriam, that I see of this project is that it's really a, a project that's larger than the sum of its parts. So each neighborhood is, if we can see them as a piece of a puzzle, each neighborhood has its own collective impact project um, uh, on a local level, working collectively. But the, the collective impact project is the, the sum of all of the neighborhoods uh, working collectively and it allows us to have this strength 
that allows to spread and deepen the effects uh, of collective work around fighting poverty and social exclusion. We don't feel like we're alone. So each neighborhood uh, feels like it's part of something larger and it allows for a lot of transversal learning and um, the hope that we can make change on a larger scale around housing issues, around food, the food system, um, and around um, meet, meeting the needs of uh, vulnerable people in our city. And um, if we can advance to the next slide, you asked me to talk about some of the challenges. And I think um, one of the main challenges in this work is the time that it takes. Uh, on a community level, on the partnership level, and on systems level, it, it takes time at the beginning to create commitment, to um, uh, uh, decide around our common aspirations. How are we going to work together uh, on a local scale, on a regional scale, um, uh, you know, making time for learning, for, for not just doing, but also take step, taking a step back and learning. All of this takes time, but that time, uh, pays off. And I think we saw that during the pandemic. Uh, neighborhoods that had taken the time to uh, decide collectively on uh, their, their initiatives that they wanted to work on, they were able to uh, react quickly to the emergency, to the urgency, and um, change their strategies and be able to respond to the needs of citizens uh, during the pandemic. And for us, that is that is. Uh, systemic change and that is very important and uh, when we talk about place-based philanthropy the fact that we were able to listen to the communities and say this is this is what they need right now this is how they need to um, change their strategies change their approach and and work differently and we're able to listen and and agree and work collectively um, and on a partnership level the time that we took in the first five years of this collective impact project has benefited also during the pandemic. And Tasha will touch to this later and Patricia also. Um, the, the foundations that are now working together that didn't work together before are able to um, um, understand how we work and when needs arise in the community are able to work together and respond to the needs quickly because we know each other and we know how to work, how we work and we know um, uh, we can respond. And I guess uh, finally, on a systems level, it's a cha it's challenging work. It's long term work, but um, the the benefits of of working on a an, in the place based approach is that we can um, we can make learn things from one neighborhood and and transfer learnings to others and and see where we can bring together other partners to make changes on a larger scale. So it's something that, that we're working on and we're involving neighborhoods uh, in, the, in the next phase on um, defining how what systems change means to them and how we can work better together in the future. I'll stop there because I know uh, I would like to hear what Tasha and Patricia have to say. Thank you so much, Rotem, for sharing um, this very inspiring and innovative example of, of place-based work. Um, I love how you um, build on the learnings from phase one to develop phase two, and also how you um, present this challenge of uh, having both the local level and the regional le level working at the same time. Um, but I also see all the potential of how this regional level can reinforce and support uh, capacity building at the local level as well, like to solve um, systemic issues. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I will now turn to Patricia and Tasha um, to know from a funder's perspective, why is your foundation supporting place-based initiatives? We've talked about the Collective Impact Project, of course, but other initiatives as well. And again, same as I asked Rotem, what are some of the benefits and challenges um, of this place-based approach from your perspective? Patricia, would you like to start? Mm, yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, perhaps we can put up the next slide just so that there's a little uh, base to go on from. Um, I'd like to start by just saying what our mission is uh, of the, at the uh, Lucie and André Chagnon Foundation. Our mission is to prevent poverty by helping create, develop conditions that will enable all young people living in Quebec to develop their full potential. 
That is our mission. And how do we fulfill this mission? Well, we provide long-term support to organizations and networks that are working together to improve the capacity, their capacity, the capacity of the people they work with to develop sustainable initiatives aimed at advancing these conditions. That is the base of our work. We have, a, I just listed a few of our guiding principles. I mentioned before, we establish close relationships based on respect, trust, and cooperation. We want with others to create sustainable conditions to enable all young people, again, to reach, to, for all young people to reach their full potential by working uh, to prevent poverty and reduce inequities. We recognize that it is our partners who can best identify the issues, solutions, and need for change. And we engage again with our partners in learnings. Um, next slide. Uh, we talked about why, why place-based uh, philanthropy is important to us, but what does it really mean? Well, for us, what it means is respecting a bottom-up approach, uh, respecting the fact that to have transformational change, uh, the collective that is working together must first have a common vision of what it all is about. Uh, proximity work is important. It means that the work that is closest to the people in the communities, neighborhoods, et cetera, is the most important. When I mention conditions, what does that mean? Well, improving living conditions, such as housing, food security, transportation, education, employment. Because if we want to develop the full potential of all young people living in Quebec, we cannot, we have to look about, we have to look at all of the conditions that are that surround the, the young and the family. Uh, so we take into consideration all of those uh, needs. We focus on more marginalized or um, underprivileged, if you want to say, communities. Empowerment is important for us, and that's why we uh, support the um, capacities that already exist to be reinforced or to develop new capacities to allow them to, um, to learn like within the communities themselves and not coming from the outside in. What can they learn? What can they um, work on? Whatever it is that they choose, because they they decide what they're working on. But we we'd like to support that whatever their decisions are. And of course, mobilization. Uh, like again, citizens. I know there was a question before. I saw when we say often citizens, does it mean residents? I think it's a question of translation because in French is participation citoyenne and if you translate citoyenne right away it's citizen like directly it's citizen so there maybe is something that we need to understand uh, a little bit clearly about what exactly do we mean but yes we mean, we mean residents of a certain community of course the ones that are closest to what the needs are should be the ones that define things uh, with uh, the different organizations working on the same issues why did we get involved in the uh, project that Ratem was speaking about? Well, we realized at one point uh, that we weren't supporting uh, initiatives in Montreal enough. We weren't supporting them enough. Uh, if we take a look at the needs, the statistics, et cetera, we, for, and from our perspective, we weren't doing enough. And we thought that uh, collaborating with Centraide du Grand Montréal was um, an important place to start from because they have experience, they have an expertise, they're already working in all of the neighborhoods in, uh, in Montreal. So that was for us a kind of a natural partnership to, to develop. And of course, after that, working together with other foundations, it's really officially one of the first times in this project that uh, nine, I think Ratemi said that nine foundations have come together to work uh, on this uh, wonderful project, but also with institutions like she mentioned, like uh, the city of Montreal or the, the regional health, um, health services. So all of us coming together and most important, working with the round tables themselves. Uh, it, it's like, a, I think we all, it's a, it's a humbling process and we all can learn a lot from each other. Um, 
And the next slide, I, I, I had to choose another example, but at uh, La Fondation uh, Chagnon, we support almost, I would say, over 50% of the money we uh, give. Well, more than 50% goes to place-based um, initiatives. So I could have chosen anyone. I mean, I'm mentioning Cosmos, but it's only as an example of many that we support all over Quebec. I think we are not present in two regions, but I'll have already started working with uh, partners uh, to, dis to discuss a, a long-term long partnership and support. So we are almost everywhere in Quebec. Cosmos, well, I mean, if I translate, means an open, supportive community promoting a society that is, that is well equipped, educated, and healthy. And like, for example, their uh, priority, uh, they work with uh, their plan, their action plan um, is for zero to 30 years old. Like you would say, well, us, it's zero to 17. Okay, zero 20. Sometimes we seven, zero 25. Like it doesn't really matter. Like in other areas, uh, the, the work that is being done, the initiative works with like, for example, the age group zero to 100. Honestly, we don't care. Once again, it's they decide. And we um, presume that the work that they're doing will touch upon the population that we care about, but it's just inside internally, internal to all of the other work that, that's being done around. So we don't care about what exactly age group it, it's all about. So, and another thing that I'd like to say is like, we could have made our job easier and saying we want to support all of the regions of Quebec. That's would have been like 17, 18 regions and we support each one, it, our job is done. But we didn't decide to do that. The, the area, the community, the municipality, the region that uh, partners want to work on, they decide themselves. So therefore, this in this case, uh, in the Bas Saint Laurent region, it is a regional partnership, but that support local initiatives. That's the model they chose, but every region chooses their own model chooses their own governance, their own way of doing things. And like I said, it could be a whole region or it could be one municipality that we support. And that's okay, because if that's the, the sense of belonging it, it is, is around that, then that's, that's what we accept. And um, we don't support like Cosmos, well, we, we, we started funding them at the beginning. I think it was 2004 when they were just starting out. But what I want to mention is we do not support only the, the strongest, the most organized. No, even if they're still trying to, they have an intention, they have, um, they want to work together, uh, but they haven't decided on what their common vision is, what their governance is. That's okay. That's okay. We support with money financially that process, which uh, we have learned. Uh, they are very grateful for because we know that that period takes time, takes effort, but it's very rare to find funding for it. So we will continue to do that. And the other thing maybe that I'd like to mention is some people could say, uh, well, some areas in Bas Saint Laurent, uh, especially the uh, municipalities more closer to the Saint Lawrence River, are you know benefit from tourism. Are, are not that impoverished, are not that marginalized, et cetera. But when you go more internally into that region, it's more rural and there are very, you know, very serious issues that need to be addressed. And so that's what we uh, also work on. Uh, they have, the Bas Saint Laurent have a regional action plan, but there are definitely parts of that action plan that is important to us. The other thing is we don't necessarily want to know exactly where our money goes. If we agree to support an initiative, a place-based initiative, then we are rarely alone as funders. There are usually other funders um, 
involved in that initiative and we fund part of it. So wherever our money goes is fine as long as they as long as it's, it supports whatever work they want to do. So we're, we, we don't want to specifically know where our money is being, uh, you know, uh, exactly where, where it actually goes. It doesn't really, really, it's not very important to us. I won't mention benefits because uh, Ratem really did a, a great job, of, you know, mentioning the fact that, uh, you know, it's a cross-sector approach, uh, citizens' participations, reinforces their capacities, et cetera. I'd like to talk about some of the challenges from a funder's perspective. And I won't mention time because Ratan, you did a wonderful job. It, we cannot forget, we wanna go fast. We wanna go fast, but no, no. It, we have to realize and understand that it takes time. I will mention that because you did. I wanna mention the fact that we continuously question our role because we do not want to replace the state, but are we actually not replacing the state? So that is a question that the government, that, that is something that, that carry is heavy on us. We always uh, ask ourselves that question. Um, we don't want to forget about the power, power imbalances, the power relations, relations. Like, you know, we, we say, we use the word partners. We work with our partners, but we cannot forget that we have the money they need the money. Already when we sit at a table together, we have to really understand that there is a power imbalance. I'm not saying that it's not possible to mention it, realize it, understand it, put it aside and work together. Obviously we've been doing it for many years, so we know it's possible, but we cannot, we cannot remove that hat of being a funder. We cannot completely remove it. We must remember that everything we say can influence. So we have to be careful about what we say and how we say it. I thought, I think that's a, an important challenge to, to mention. That's all for now. And I'm sure we'll get back. I want to catch up because we're also, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. I see uh, Madison in the chat box um, uh, sharing that's fantastic that she loves it. Um, thank you for sharing those insights and also for uh, opening us up to uh, the rest of Quebec because we uh, hear a lot about what's going on in Montreal in terms of place-based work, but it's good to know that there are examples all across the province that we can refer to as well. So, um, Tasha, now your turn. Would you like to uh, share with us a few words about what the Foundation does, why you are involved in place-based work, and, and what are some of the initiatives that you support? Um, thanks, Miriam. Thanks, Patricia and Ratem, for your insight. Um, our new mission and vision, hot off the press, it's uh, we've just, our, our board has just uh, approved our, our new mission and, and vision and, and values on the next slide, and it won't be officially public until we launch it in January. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're really clear that, that this language that we're here to serve and listen to our communities and to work in collaboration with, with our different partners. And I think what Patricia said about um, what partnership means is, is really important. I, I just quickly, I was at another workshop with the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund a couple of weeks ago, and that there was a discussion there around the use of the language of partnership when working with Indigenous communities. And that and that, you know, there was sort of a warning that we couldn't use the language of partnership until we were really true actual partners and that we weren't there yet at all as funders. So I think um, Patricia's reflection is, is really interesting there. Um, I think we can move to the, to the next slide, Connor. In terms of, of our values, again, we see listening um, and, and collaboration as key pieces. Also the idea of innovation, so working in new ways. And of course, uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, which I hope are not seen as, as buzzwords and that this is lasting in the culture that we're, we're, we're creating and reconnect creating in, in the sector. And I think that the word justice is extremely important because it speaks to systems change. Um, it, it, and, and so I think that one of the reasons that we're part of place-based philanthropy is really 
um, for that systems change um, systems change um, lens. Next slide. So uh, Ratem spoke extremely eloquently about, about the PIC or the SIP, which is not how we say it, the Projet de Collective Impact Project that, that we're involved in as partners. And there's been a huge amount of learning for the Foundation of Greater Montreal um, through, through our participation in the PIC. And I think that that's really one of the reasons that it's been so valuable because it, you know, it was an experiment and, and Centred really took a risk in saying, we want to work in a new way and we want to bring partners around the table who are willing to take this risk with us and work in a new way. And the fact that we're in our second phase and um, most, most of the partners are continuing and we have some new ones on board is really a testament to the fact that this new, um, this new way of working for Montreal is valuable. And that it, you know one of the things that we've been talking about as we're, we're building the second phase around the table is how it's also the, the approach of working closely with neighborhoods, with neighborhood tables, allow recognizing that you know, people in communities have, who are living in these communities have, um, have the greatest stake. They have the, the most at stake, much more than a funder that can come in and you know, from our so-called ivory towers and, and come up with all the answers. And I, I think I'll just quickly speak to my interpretation of the, the question about resident and citizen. Um, to me, and this is my own opinion, the idea of a resident is maybe something that's passive. It, it describes where you live. And I think that in, in, in involving people who live in, in a given place is, is really important. But to me, the, the, the word citizen um, recognizes that there's um, a potential for action. It's more of an active descriptor. So I, I think the word citizen works in both French and in English. But I would be happy to have that conversation with with anyone who's interested. Asha, interested. But I think I think the question was like the fact that a citizen actually means a person, you know, legal legal status of legal status. And the question was like maybe what about like a refugee or someone without. Oh. So and I and and that's what I think uh, the the maybe the little confusion from French English comes in. Okay, for sure that that makes sense to me that it doesn't it's not citizen in the sense of um, legal, legal status. status. Yeah, thank you yeah. for clarifying that. Um, so so we're really involved in the pick. We're also involved in in we've been involved. I think that what was interesting to talk about in the this example of the Consortium Covid Quebec is that it's an example of how place-based philanthropy can also work in a crisis situation. So um, four foundations, Trottier, the Trottier Family Foundation, the Saputo, or the Mirella and Lino Saputo Foundation, um, the Molson Foundation, and Jaroslawski Foundation came together and said, we want to do some work um, that's going to have an impact on COVID and really decided to have a public health and prevention approach and thought about how, how they could work and, and, and some of the issues that Patricia raised as well around what is the role of the state, what is the role of philanthropy, how can be, we, we be working in complementarity was, was really important. Um, but what, what we decided or what was decided that the Foundation of you know, Montreal was not a funder of this, but we provided a lot of um, resources in order to allow the project to be carried out and uh, human resources and expertise. And, and basically the idea was that social infrastructure was in place in communities and in many, in, in some of the communities, thanks to all the work that the PIC had done to build capacity in those communities, um, except that the PIC had been in 17 communities and we did all of the communities. At the, um, at the time. And so really an intensive effort where we said, okay, we wanna have a prevention approach. It's not happening at the state level. We know that grassroots approaches to public health prevention are important. And we provided money to the social infrastructure that was in place with just really some general guidelines that there needed to be money for coordination so that the different organizations who had different types of expertise could be um, communicating and also that they could be working closely with other types of partners from public health, from the city of Montreal. 
um, that there was an element of awareness raising and communication and mobilization, um, support for access to testing, vaccination, and then specific support for high risk groups. So really those were the guidelines that we gave the different communities and then they built their own action plans based on the needs in the communities, whether they developed um, brigades going door to door, how they were collecting data, how they were, you know, were they deciding to support, you know, specific like seniors or specific other types of populations. So, so all of those kinds of decisions really came from them. So there is clearly here a tension between a top down and a bottom up approach. Um, which I think is often the case in my experience in this place-based work. Um, but with, with a clear recognition that the expertise resides at the, at the community level. Um, next slide, Connor. I'm conscious of time and I know that there's questions and I think all three, all four of us could talk about this for hours and in fact we do. <laughs> Yeah, I can see how passionate you are about all this work. So yeah, if you want to share with us some lesson learns and in the, uh, for the sake of time, I'll um, just merge some of the next questions I had because I'd like our participants to be able to share their own questions um, and get your insights on them as well. Sure. So go ahead, Tasha. Yeah, so, so the fact that the, 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 the expertise lies in communities, I think is, is so, so, so important. And, and I think that's really crucial. And I already said that, you know, we're trying to turn philanthropy on its head. And I think that recognition of how, where, the, where the power dynamics lie is, is key. In terms of lessons learned, social infrastructure and social capital is key to success. So what do I mean by social infrastructure? That's the, the existence of the community tables, the round tables that exist. Social capital is where, where do the relationships lie? How does, how do, you know, how do people interact with each other? What are, what's the leadership capacity within, within community organizations or community networks? And we really saw that where that, both the social infrastructure and the social capital was the strongest, that was where the, the projects had the most success. Naming power imbalances, that's like my biggest, biggest thing. If you haven't already caught that, I, I can say it. Listening. And listening, you know, we, we've heard, and I'm sure many of you've read Decolonizing Wealth, and if you haven't, then please do. But um, Edgar Villanueva in that book refers to some other sociologist who talks about different ways of listening. And, you know, we can listen for what we already know, and we're all probably really good at that. I know I catch myself doing it sometimes, but there's also listening for what other people like to learn, to actually really learn and to actually really hear what, what other people have to to, to share with us. And so I think that's really important, which leads, of course, to building relationships and trust. And, and I think we've mentioned that already, that we need to be in there for the long haul, the permission to fail, um, and, and, and the real listening. That's, that's what allows us to build the, these relationships where people, um, and, and I think that's also related to the fact that as funders, we're not um, only they are necessarily writing a check. And that was really clear in the, in the pick through the process and, and through the process in, in the other example that I gave. Um, we open doors, we make connections, we bring other types of expertise, we can be a sounding board. So, so really positioning ourselves, not just as check writers, but as part of a process of change making, I think um, is really, really important to this, this approach and to philanthropy in general. Um, collaboration across sectors, we've mentioned that. Patricia also mentioned go slow to go fast. That's one of my favorite little slogans. Um, and, and Rotem mentioned it as well, I believe that, you know, we really have to, you know, make sure the roles are clear, make sure that, that people, people are, you know, that, that we're building these relationships. And, and so going slow to do that on the front end, even in a crisis situation like the, 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 the COVID um, consortium, you know, where that was done really well in communities, the, the projects were able, even if it took longer to get going, the projects were able to have more impact. And, and where there was really a rush to get things moving without the, getting the buy-in, without everyone understanding their roles. We had a lot of, um, you know, there, there ended up being slowdowns 
later, later on in the process and frustrations. The flexibility and agility is key. As funders, we, we have to learn how to do that better. And we hear that over and over and over again from our, from our different stakeholders. Committing to the long term as a funder, if we expect long term solutions, I think that's obvious for everyone, but not the way we practice philanthropy right now, particularly. And I've said this, you know, my messages are clear, allowing for innovation means allowing for failure. So I think that that's that's also really important to remember. Thank you so much, Tasha, for sharing all those um, learnings. Um, I'd like to um, take a bit of time to answer questions from our participants. I see enthusiastic comments about um, what has been said um, in the chat box. So I invite you to, um, to have a look at them. Um, if you have um, questions for our panelists, please use the chat box to write them. In the meantime, I'd like to invite each of you to um, share a piece of advice that you have for our participants that are uh, working in place-based philanthropy or that are interested in, in working um, with this approach at the community level or a final thought that you'd like to share with our participants because um, before we go on to questions. Rotem, would you like to share with us a piece of advice or a final thought? Um... Advice. Well, I wanted to say thank you to Tasha. You really, you really summed up all the lessons that we've learned over the project. Um, I guess I think it's important to the, the advice. I mean, it, it's the time. It really takes time. It's a long-term um, process. And um, when we we would decide to engage, when we decide to collaborate, it's really important to recognize that 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 it takes time and. Um, and we need to be able to be to change, to be flexible and to decide to, to say, OK, we drew something on paper, we wrote something down, but you know what? It doesn't work. And so that's OK. And we learn from that. And um, I, do, I think in our institutions and in our in our in our normal way of work, we don't do that enough. We don't recognize that that doesn't that didn't work. And so let, it's OK. We can just try a, a different way and improve. And, um, I guess that's my advice. Don't don't worry to ma about making mistakes and allow for mistakes as funders too. And and we know that that communities are, will grow from that as in the, as we grow too from from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful piece of advice, um, Patricia. Would you like to add a final thought or a piece of advice? Well, if there's something positive coming out of the pandemic, if I can be allowed to say that. Uh, is that we've learned, like we, we use the words flexibility, agile, but what do we really mean when we say that? Well, the pandemic has definitely shown us ways that we can be flexible and agile, and they are things that we will continue doing. What do we mean is, for example, it's up to us to review our internal processes to respect the needs of the communities and not the other way around. For example, um, you know, giving additional funds for, for, for the work that they wanted to do because things have changed, to be flexible in that way, to uh, extend the protocols that we have. Be, again, be flexible because that's what is needed. Reallocation of funds, uh, also possible. So these are things that we were open to before, but it seemed that during the time of pandemic, well, we actually put them in put them into action. And it's something that really works because it respects, it respects the needs of the people we work with, the people we support. And uh, another thing that I'd like to see, perhaps say is, you know, like let's not, we know we talk about time and how important that is, but what it really means is that respecting the democratic processes that the, the people we work with have and we want them to go at a certain space, but no, because if they have to, uh, with their partners or their members or whoever that is around uh, working on the same initiative, well, they might have to, you know, you know, once in a while go back and, and revisit, like you were saying, Rata, maybe things have changed or they, they had an idea, but they have to, you know, work differently or do something else. So all of that takes time. And you have to respect those democratic processes or else 
uh, there will be more problems, like Tasha said, you know, more problems uh, to resolve later rather than taking the time to do it correctly from the beginning. That's what I'd like to add. Thank you, Patricia. Tasha? I'll go super fast. I guess I, what I would say is that we don't need to be reinventing the wheel. I think that there are lots of examples that exist. And I think one of the strongest things that we've done in both the PIC and in the Consortium COVID Quebec was um, building communities of practice where, 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 where both the funders and also the, the different community stakeholders are really sharing their, their, their knowledge, their experiences, and that so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Go find resources um, because they exist and people are really generous with their sharings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Or with their sharing, with sharing their learnings. Mm -hmm. and, and about that, I see a question um, for all three of you in the chat box about um, what has been your approach to measurement and learning in context of flexible funding? So, um, I can go and uh, speak for the Collective Impact Project. Go ahead. Um, we, are, we have allowed neighborhoods in the same way that neighborhoods could decide what to work on um, to address poverty. They also are, can decide what to learn and what to evaluate. Um, that it has to be helpful to them. And so I think that has been the key to being flexible um, we, and also providing support so that communities can do the evaluation and the learning uh, internally themselves, but build the capacity to do it themselves and be able to use it in other contexts and other, other issues. But it, the key, I think, is that it has to be useful to you. Um, and so the, the Collective Impact Project, the funders are not telling communities what to evaluate, but uh, providing support to do it in order to, to continually improve and learn. Patricia, do you want to say something? Well, I, I, I totally agree with uh, your approach, Ratem, that you, you're bringing forth. Uh, to be totally transparent, uh, we've actually eliminated a whole team whose, whose title was like performance team at the foundation. We used to have like three people. That was their, the team's name, performance team. Uh, we understand that you eliminated the people's uh, name. Title. But not the people. Title. <laughs> Yeah, we got that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the titles. The, so the per actual, performance is not on the agenda. No, performance is not on the agenda. Evaluation is not a term that we use anymore. We use uh, apprentissage, which is learning. So we we decide together with our with the partners that we work with what it, what it is that they want to you know look into or learn from, learn about. And uh, like you said, the priority is that it's important to them, not for us, mm -hmm. it's important to them. So I think that uh, we, 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 the only thing that we can evaluate within our foundation is, are we giving the, the right support to the right people? That's it. That's what we make decisions on. So that's what we can evaluate ourselves on. The rest of the work uh, doesn't, uh, belong to us directly, belongs to the people that we support, and it's up to them to decide what evaluation plan, like I said, we don't even use that word anymore, what they want to do, how they want to do it, with who they want to do it, and we uh, basically accept whatever plan they have. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, lots of people in the chat box, not many questions. I think you were all um, very <laughs> clear, but people really um, showing appreciation to the information, the case studies and the approach um, that was shared. I'd like to thank the three of you very much for this um, broad-minded thinking. And also um, I echo um, Lisa's comment in the chat box saying that philanthropy has gone a long way. There's still a long way to go, but hearing from the three of you, I think is very uh, inspiring and reveals that, um, yeah, the place-based work, putting the community at the center of the work is something that is possible and that um, there's a lot of room uh, to develop this potential um, in the wider field of philanthropy. So thank you very, very much for um, sharing those insights, sharing your wisdom, 
um, with us today. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, thank you for your comments, your questions, and a warm thank you to our uh, panelists. It's always a pleasure to meet with you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank Thanks you, Miriam. For everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.